Hey everyone, thanks for joining me again on my YouTube channel and another episode of Workshop Quick Takes. Today's video took a little longer to put together because it's about wiring, and wiring can be very tedious to do. It can be even more tedious to watch. You probably don't want to sit there at home and watch cut, strip, splice, crimp over and over again. Cut, strip, splice, crimp, cut, strip, ugh. okay, never mind. Well, instead, this is going to be more of a problem solving guide for a very irritating issue that comes up in particular on the 84 to 2001 Jeep Cherokee, the XJ series, but also on other vehicles as well. And that's poorly designed boots between doors or hatches, in this case, the lift gate, that break up and cause serious wiring problems, anywhere from accessories that don't work to actual melted wiring or fires. These are issues that if they start to pop up, you don't want to let them linger. They're not going to get better, and they are going to do more damage, which is something we'll find out in today's video as well. So, we're going to look at the problem and say, hey, wait a minute, can we do better than just replacing it like it was OE? Hopefully, a little bit different approach that won't break as quickly. And maybe you've got a problem like that you'd like to solve too. So, thanks for joining me. Let's see what we can do about it. If you have a 1984 to 2001 Jeep Cherokee, this may be an unhappy and familiar sight. As Chrysler updated and modernized the original AMC design for the XJ Cherokee, the liftgate became crammed with electrical accessories. Besides the obvious license plate light and door switch, which is integrated into the latch assembly, your newer Jeep might also have a rear window defroster, a rear wiper, central locking, and a third brake light. Since the liftgate is hinged and can't carry any body grounds, that generally means at least two wires per device, resulting in a bundle of around 15 conductors. And since Chrysler was never smart enough to redesign the liftgate to use an S-configured harness or at least fine-stranded wire, that means the entire tape bundle of standard auto wire, along with the weatherproof boot it passes through, is supposed to survive a 90-degree bending motion every time the liftgate opens or closes. There is a strain relief sleeve just inside the main body of the wagon, but it's only a token provision. So if the liftgate is used frequently, after a decade or more of use, the loom will start to disintegrate. Then broken wires, then short circuits and blown fuses, and possibly toasted wire looms. The harness we need to deal with today has a connector mounting plate at the top of the tailgate, passes through the weather boot and across the liftgate opening inside the cabin, and interfaces to a main body harness behind the driver's side rear wheel arch. Before we can get there though, we'll need to remove a few trim panels. These include the tailgate interior trim cover, already pulled by the time this video was filmed, a couple more trim pieces at the top and bottom of the tailgate opening, another side piece at the upper left of the opening, and the rear quarter trim behind the wheel arch. Also, the spare tire bracket has to come out if you still have that installed. In this vehicle, the task mostly involves a lot of screws, although the tire bracket also uses a couple bolts, and the tailgate cover also relies on those circular nylon trim clips that are often found behind door trim panels. That gets us to this connector location. Incidentally, this is also where you need to look if you want to install a pre-terminated trailer wiring adapter on a Cherokee XJ. Most of the liftgate wiring loom passes through these connectors, but there are also body ground terminals that need to be disconnected. With that done, it's time to pull this loom section out of the car. To do that, we have to fish it out of the body of the wagon, after first making sure all connectors and accessories are disconnected. Note that the third brake light has its own connector that requires pulling the fixture in order to make the disconnection. Finally, remove the whole contraption from the vehicle by pulling the boot from between the body and the lift gate, and then feeding everything else out of the two boot holes. The repaired or replaced loom will be fished back in the same way, just like it was at the factory. If the boot on your rear window's washer fluid line is also damaged like ours was, this will also need to be disconnected at the lift gate and fed back into the main body before that boot can be addressed. Which you should, since this boot can also allow water into the body, lift gate, or both. In fact, for the repair we have in mind, there is no choice. We want to convert the wire loom into an S configuration, and to do that, we'll need to cross-feed both of these passages. This here is the idea I'm going to try for repairing that liftgate harness. This is the wiring harness out of the liftgate, not on the Jeep outside, but from another one. 
Now, why would I care about having this? Well, this is a part that's not likely to fail. It doesn't have any flex points, so you can buy these all day long fairly cheap. You get the exact same loom of wires, color-coded, correct gauges, and from because it snakes all the way through the lift gate as a single continuous line and then just has takeoffs anywhere there's a piece of equipment, there is probably not quite a meter or three feet roughly of cable from right here, if we make a cut there, to here where the first defroster takeoff is. So if we take this piece of cable and we cut the uh, busted loom body loom just a little bit inside the tailgate uh, attachment near the ceiling, splice it in at one point, we then have this much wire to get out back into the tailgate and splice again, and that'll allow me to do a second modification to this that hopefully will avoid a future failure of this kind. I have here this uh, fire sleeve I picked up fairly cheap on eBay. It was like $5 a foot or something. And I can run this inside that and then maybe put some split loom around this again and, and wrap it one more time and end up with a really nice durable weatherproof connection. And rather than try to wrap it through the existing connector where it was and it has to flex this far, which this cable is not made to do, I can instead come out at the uh, liftgate point, across, and then in where the washer currently goes. And then when it lifts and closes, it'll do this instead, and that'll put a lot less strain and stress on the wire. And then I can also then reroute the washer so it does the same thing back over in, and comes into the wiring loom. And that, hopefully, will solve the problem for the remaining life of this vehicle. Well now, that's big talk from a small man. Here's the catch. To match the OEM installation method, the replacement boot has to be constructed before we splice the wire, because the bare wire has to be fed through the boot before final terminations are made. Let's find out if our protagonist can handle that job. Okay, this is where I'm going with my attempts to uh, rebuild the uh, harness, except this time, instead of having it just a short little thing that has to flex over 90 degrees in a space like this, which is just terrible design. <laughs> I'm gonna try and swap the holes because I got two holes over here on the lift gate where the electrical harness came through and two over here where the washer fluid tube came through so what I'm gonna do is cross them over. The washer fluid tube is going to come out right where it does now from the uh, around the passenger side of up the uh, back and then out but then it's gonna cross over and come up in this hole over here where the wiring harness originally went into the lift gate and the wiring harness will do the opposite. It will come out of the body shell where it does now, but then cross over and come up over in where the washer tube, uh, fluid tube was and then just back over. Um, I will have to lengthen the wiring harness, but given what I'm looking at now, that's pretty much in a, <laughs> unavoidable anyway. But in the meantime, this is going to be the replacement harness for the washer fluid tube. And what I've done is I've taken little boots that come on these things and, I've, and you know, they're already torn. So what I did is I actually just cut the two boot ends off Okay, I've gone ahead and cleaned up these boots with uh, lacquer thinner. The lacquer thinner probably attacks the surface of the rubber a little bit, or at least that's what I'm hoping, and that'll kind of prime it in order to receive and bond to this Permatex Ultra Black. So, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get each end going here with the sealant. And actually, I need to go ahead and get this started through first because it's a little tricky otherwise. So yeah, this 5 8 uh, sleeve, fire sleeve, it has a silicone jacket, and then of course this uh, fire resistant braid inside. Uh, it's designed for heat proofing things, but in this case I'm going to use it because it's waterproof. So I'll fill the boots, like so, and then add one additional outer coating that's protective but doesn't have to be water resistant. Okay, the other side is going to be a little more interesting because I don't have that nice long uh, boot jacket there to bond to. There's just this small little area, so I think I'm going to have to fill this in instead. Alright, give that time to cure and hopefully that's going to be the basis of both of our boots. And then what I figure I can also do afterwards is take some of this uh, high grade split loom and just wrap the outside of this thing maybe. Should be enough there to go around 5 8 And that'll just provide some abrasion protection for the silicone. But the silicone itself and the Permatex will then provide the actual weather resistance at the boot interface. Didn't quite catch that the first time, you say? Well, here's the other one being reconstructed at light speed.
Using some of the template sketches pictured previously, we worked out how much wire needed to be added into the loom to fit our new S configuration, and then cut that length out of the spare tailgate harness. A spare wire pair from the bin was added to complete the third brake light circuit through the splice section. Normally, it's preferable to use compression connectors in automotive wiring. A high quality connector, properly crimped to form a cold weld, is reliable and standard in modern automobiles. Unlike soldering, it doesn't risk causing heat damage to conductor surface coatings or to conductor insulation, either of which can cause the soldered connection to fail downstream of the joint at some future time. However, crimped connectors add bulk to a wire loom, and since we were repairing dozens of connections on a vehicle that probably has 10 years at most of remaining life, solder and heat shrink connections were the order of the day. Additionally, high heat sources are cumbersome and risky inside of a vehicle, but relatively easy to manipulate on a workbench. Okay, so let's start crossing bearing. Here's the connector that brings in the rear window defroster. Black, black with white tracer, black, black with white tracer. Although wires in a common loom normally have discrete color codes, to reduce the likelihood of splicing errors, it can be helpful to break them out by connectors and then complete one full connector at a time. Once the first round of splices were complete, pre-wrapping was required. Our approach is to use Scotch Super 33 Plus electrical tape. Although any brand of electrical tape might work, the Super 33 Plus is one we're willing to pay for because it is very flexible, reasonably thin, has just the right amount of stickiness, and maintains those characteristics over a wide temperature range. Sometimes we also like to work with cloth tape for abrasion resistance and noise dampening, but at $15 per roll from eBay, Amazon, and other online suppliers, it's better to do any detailed wraps with the electrical tape and then use the cloth tape more sparingly. Additionally, the electrical tape is somewhat fire resistant, so it's probably not wise to use the cloth tape as the primary wrapping insulator. One additional point about splices, stagger them if at all possible. If all the splices are made at a single point in the loom, the result will look like a mouse inside a gold snake and may not pull or store cleanly in the final installation. By staggering the splices at intervals, the final loom will be as compact as possible. Once the initial round of splicing was complete, we took the additional precaution of surrounding the splice with a fire sleeve tubing. If a splice fails and burns, our hope is that the sleeve will contain it until enough ground faults have occurred to blow out the upstream fuses. This approach may not be practical for all installations, but in this case we have adequate space under the trim panel to secure the sleeve section, so hey, why not? Next, the loom is fed through the replacement boot section. This step must take place before we make the second round of splices. Finally, the second round of splices are made and one more step is required before reinstalling. We're gonna do continuity checks and we're gonna do it by color codes. Make sure just one more time that one, everything actually is passing through securely and that I didn't accidentally cross over a wire when I spliced between the two sides. Let's start with the rear window defroster. This one's critical because I want to make sure I got the fat ground on here back to the fat ground on here and didn't accidentally wire it on here. If I were to do that, best case scenario, the rear window defroster wouldn't work very efficiently because of the extra resistance in the wiring, but worst case, it might actually overheat it. So there is my ground connection. Meter shows continuity through itself. One wire good. At this point, you've probably spent several hours making repairs and are eager to plug everything back in and prove that it works. Brown with a black tracer. 
comes out over here. Good. Stifle that urge, no matter how strong, and pull out a multimeter for continuity checks. This will be your proof that all wires travel through the loom as expected. Get a bad result? Do yourself a favor. Take the rest of the night off. Come back to it in the morning. Strip back your neat wrapping job and figure out what went wrong. Because if you plug it in and it's wired wrong, yeah. The only thing worse than doing this job once is doing it twice. Alrighty, now that it's put together, let's review what we've got here. These are the harnesses that plug in at the left rear side of the uh, body harness. And then continue up rear, I don't know, C-pillar or D-pillar, whatever it is, to the back top and then over to where the lift gate is. These are the grounds. There's three of them here, of course. Note that one is heavier than the other. This one goes to the defroster in the rear. And then these two return from the windshield wiper motor circuit and all other circuits. And then these two plugs here combine the remaining functions. This part here that has the plastic wrap, that's mostly factory. I just added some cloth tape. That goes up the rear column back there. And then it comes out near the top. That snaps in. That snaps in right above kind of an open gap area. And so I've taken all the splices and I've wrapped them in this fire sleeve here. So if one of them goes bad and starts smoking, this should hopefully contain it and keep it from turning into a full vehicle fire. But then also then there's silicone tape wrap around here and the edges to hold everything together. This is just small enough it should fit through the hole when I actually put it in because the way this harness is reinstalled is this, standing outside facing the lift gate, this has to be fed in down into the body. And then this part here has to be fed into the lift gate and then both of these two rubber pieces. But hopefully this arrangement, when the lift gate turns, it's not going to uh, torque the wires as badly as before because it'll be splitting the load between both of these bundles and they'll be able to twist in there rather than having to have just one little section like that fold 90 degrees. I haven't actually completely tied this down yet. I can still slide this back and forth a little bit if I need to in order to properly locate the cable. Coming out on this side then, this is going to come out in the lift gate and it's gonna come out in the hole that was formerly reserved for the uh, washer fluid because that also folded over through in that little 90 degree bend. And now it crosses over, this one crosses over. So I have to have some extra harness over here to get back across past the third brake light and over to where the uh, this attachment point is inside the lift gate. And then these will plug in. Rear window defroster plugs in there. That's the uh, rear window wiper motor. And then this one here is all the remaining functions inside the lift gate, including the license plate light uh, and a couple other items. And that plugs in there. And then this one here, hanging off the edge, goes to the third brake light. All right, let's see how we can go about this. Now this has to be fed two ways. One way is gonna be up through here and over to this. And the other way is gonna be back through. Once the wire-by-wire -wire continuity checks are complete, you've done all you can do. Plug it back in, check your fuse panels for dead units, and start testing it for functionality. The loom must be reinstalled by fitting the respective ends into the lift gate and body shell, then fishing the whole thing through until the weather boots can finally be reseated. After that, all connectors were replugged, and it was time to test the liftgate accessories. And yeah, we had a problem. Everything worked except the rear windshield wiper circuit. What could that mean? Here was our first clue. Off camera, we tore down the failed wiring harness between the liftgate and the left rear connector bracket, and found that the fatal fault had started with the windshield wiper circuit. It could have been any circuit, of course, but given that the wiper is likely to be used year-round and is a high-current circuit, it did make sense that those conductors had finally killed the loom. However, we had now repaired the loom, and there didn't seem to be any obvious damage along the body harness that runs beneath the driver's side door sills back to the main junction block. What next?
epilog here. At some point when the harness previously shorted up under the, another owner, it, it killed all the rear hatch accessories as you expect. After I replaced the rear section that was bad, everything worked except the rear wiper motor and the rear sprayer. Now, when I connected the rear wiper motor up to 12 volts, it worked fine at the back using just a jump pack. So, yeah, this is where we are now. And the answer to that question was found by spending another Saturday under the front dash. The first place to look after double checking the fuses was at the switch cluster in the bottom of the center console below the HVAC controls. That's where the rear wiper control lives. And the first sign of a problem was that the switch failed a continuity check when it was operated. Upon opening up said switch, the internal components simply fell apart, having previously melted. Strike one for resolving this problem in a timely fashion. However, upon chasing wires back from the switch, we discovered more melted grounds all the way back into the main cabin loom that runs below the dash. It appeared that when the wiring for the motor circuit found a ground connection in the chewed up boot at the rear hatch, the high fault currents not only damaged that loom, but also melted ground connections in the main cabin loom back to the next splice point, where the return currents then had a much larger conductor to follow. It's hard to tell whether a fuse failure or the melted switch innards broke the circuit first. All of this happened before we bought the vehicle, but either way, it had to be fixed. Fortunately, Although the melted grounds had damaged insulation on a few adjacent conductors in the bundle, no other circuits were permanently damaged. However, heat damaged insulation can become conductive, so it was important to split apart the loom as much as possible along the damaged ground wires, find any browning or blackening, and tape wrap those wires to ensure no future problems. The damaged ground wires themselves had to be completely replaced, and a few harness sections were rewrapped. Finally, because the wiper switch was beyond repair, we ordered the entire switch panel from a salvage supplier on eBay and just swapped it outright for around $20. That's the one saving grace of working on an extremely common vehicle. The parts are variously available and affordable in all flavors of original equipment, aftermarket, and salvage recovery. The upshot of all this work is that once the wiring was tidied back up and the new panel arrived, everything worked. Cross another one off the list and move forward on the project vehicle. Thanks for joining me everyone. Um, that was a little bit long, but hopefully it provided some useful tips as well as, again, to emphasize what we started with. If you've got wiring problems cropping up on a vehicle, don't ignore them. Sooner or later, it's not going to just be an accessory that quits working. It could be a blown out loom. And on many vehicles, especially older vehicles, if you lose an entire wiring loom like ours almost did, the vehicle's probably trash. So. Get on top of the problems early while they're still easy to fix. Hope to see you next time. Has anyone seen my phone?